Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to this session on how to achieve world ready domination in ASP on MBC. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here at ASP Comp, my first time, so uh, really looking forward to sharing a whole bunch of information with you. Um, as Rich said, my name is Guy Smith Ferrier. You can get me on Twitter at Guy Smith Ferrier, my email address, guy at guysmithferrier.com, and my website, guysmithferrier.com. Kind of a theme going on there. Uh, so we have a bunch of stuff that I'm going to cover um, in the next hour and a quarter. I'm just going to work through an agenda now. We've got very little slides, um, and this is mostly all demos. So this is demo after demo after demo, a huge amount of content here. So we're going to start. This presentation is all about uh, how to internationalize your ASP.NET MVC applications, uh, a huge subject, like I say. We're going to start off with... Um, uh, we're going to start off with setting the culture. So that will be how do your users uh, provide information to you to set the culture for your ASP.NET uh, uh, MVC application. We'll move on to actually localizing ASP.NET MVC. So that's localizing text wherever it may appear. A fairly large subject. Uh, not, not too difficult, though. Then we're going to move on to doing uh, internationalizing data annotations. That will be localizing data annotations. And then moving on to globalization of data annotations. We'll talk about internationalizing JavaScript. Again, localizing JavaScript and globalizing JavaScript. Two distinct areas. Uh, lots of good stuff to cover there. And finally, we're going to finish off with uh, internationalizing data templates. So coverage of things like uh, booleans, enums, um, and address formats. So a large amount to cover there. Just before we get started, um, here's how you can get the slides and the source code. If you go to my website, uh, and I'm going to uh, put up a link right at the end of the presentation, um, but uh, if you want the slides and source codes right now, go to my website, www.guysmithferrier.com. And down on the left-hand side, you can see there's a link which says resources. Uh, if you click on that, uh, you can see all the presentations that... Uh, uh, I've given for, I don't know, a long time. Um, and the top one there is internationalizing ASP.NET MVC, uh, which is another name for this same talk. Cool. Uh, yeah, so this is how you download the slides and the source code. The slides, as I say, there's only a few slides here. Uh, the source code is the bit that you want. Uh, so a shameless plug, uh, and because I'm from the UK, uh, I, I don't really do marketing, so... Uh, uh, I feel really quite dirty uh, talking about my own book here. I swear I'm going to have a shower immediately after this presentation. Uh, I wrote a book here uh, called .NET Internationalization. It's, uh, it's uh, seven years old now. It covers uh, Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Forms um, and does not cover MVC or Silverlight or WPF or Windows Mobile. However, uh, I want you to jot down the uh, the URL there, www.netiatn.com. There's a bunch of source code on there. You don't need to buy the book or anything like that. A bunch of source code for solving internationalization problems. And it's going to solve a few problems that uh, we'll encounter today. So I'll put the link up again at the end of uh, the presentation. But you, know, you might want that if you're going to follow along. So a quick word on terminology. And you will have heard the words internationalization and globalization and localization as I used in the agenda slide there. And although people use these words interchangeably, uh, they do actually have different meanings. They mean different things. So bear with me for a couple of minutes. And I'm, I'm just going to give you like the 101 of, of, of internationalization. So starting at the bottom of the slide there on the far left hand side, we've got globalization. And this is the adaptation of your program such that uh, you have no cultural preconceptions in it. Now, a uh, cultural preconception is something, one of the most obvious here is something like a date format. We're, we're well aware of the fact that uh, in the UK here we use uh, DDMMYY, and in the US it's uh, MMDDYY. And all around the world, each different region has got a, a different format uh, for it's dates using slashes or dots or dashes and different uh, orders of uh, different pieces of the uh, of the dates. That's a globalization issue. So anything which is a cultural preconception. So if you think that all dates work this way, that's a cultural preconception. And obviously dates is the one that everybody knows, but it's not limited to dates. So we're talking about uh, numbers and whether you have a period 
uh, for a decimal separator or a thousand separator. So numbers, currencies, not just the currency symbol, but where the currency symbol appears, how the number is formatted, uh, collation sequences, comparisons. And this is not limited to things which are covered by the .NET framework. Um, it goes beyond the .NET framework itself. So we'd be talking about things like postcodes, uh, address layouts, um, the uh, formatting of people's names, all globalization issues. So that's all the work that you need to do to adapt your program so that it has no cultural preconceptions inside it. Now, moving to the right-hand side of that, we've got localizability. This is all the work that you need to do to make your application capable of being localized. So if we have a string embedded inside our application, um, that string is hardwired, we need to uh, remove it, uh, extract it in some way, and place it in some format in which it could be changed by a localizer or a translator. Now, if you make your, cap you know, you make your application capable of doing that, you have made it localizable. You haven't localized it, that's the job of the localizer, who will come along later and he'll then translate the strings or localize the application. Now, the umbrella term for globalization and localizability is world readiness. And basically, that's your job. That's all the work that you need to do. You make your application world ready, and then it's everybody else's problem to localize it um, and potentially to customize it. So the umbrella term for uh, the entire process is internationalization. And you can be forgiven for uh, getting these terms mixed up because the terminology that I'm showing you here is the Microsoft definition of these terms, or more specifically, uh, the .NET Framework and Visual Studio definition of these terms. And they're not the same as everybody else. So if you go beyond, outside the world of Microsoft, you'll find that the terms globalization and internationalization are transposed uh, for historical reasons. And I'm sure you don't really care why that is, uh, but that's the way it is. Okay, so let's move on. Right, so I've got a little program here that I'm going to work through. Let me just grab a bit of water first. So we've got a little um, application here which is going to help me go through lots of different demos. Uh, you can see here there's a tab which says setting the culture and the different t uh, headings for the tabs, the different areas that I'm going to work through uh, for this presentation. You can see there's a bunch of buttons here and these fire up the different demos. I am not going to go through every single demo. I have so much content that I need to cover here. I'm picking things out, so I'm cherry picking my way through the demos. And I'm assuming that you're going to download the source code and, and look at anything that I might have skipped over. So we'll start off with um, setting the, cal the culture according to the browser's accept language header. So let me just start this application off and then we'll look at the source code in a second. Uh, let me just wait for the screen to catch up here. There we go. Good. Here's a standard MVC3 application. Um, I've got a number of the demos that I'm doing are MVC3 and then a number are MVC4. Where I'm using MVC4 is because it's uh, uh, got a feature which is required by MVC4. So if you're just using MVC3, that's a, a good way of working out can you actually use these features or not. So if I go to, I'm in Internet Explorer 9 here, if I go to Tools and then go down to Internet Options and we can bring up a page here, uh, there's a, a button which says Languages, I click on Languages and we get the Language Preference. Now there's the same dialogue um, in IE9 uh, and Firefox and Chrome, so you can set this Language Preference in all three of those browsers, not in Safari. Safari works slightly differently, it picks it out of the operating system and you can't interfere with that process. Now, if you do this on your machine and you've installed um, English Windows with English IE, it's almost certain that your language setting here will be empty. You'll have nothing in here. Um, as you can see, I've got a fair few number of items in here because this is what I do. This is my job. Uh, so I've got lots of different settings in here. Why this is interesting um, is because if you install uh, French IE on French Windows, then this value will automatically be set. It's not required uh, for the user to go along and set it, set it, it will be set automatically. And this will be passed to your application. So if I take my 
uh, setting for French here and I bump it up to the top of the list and then I click on OK and click on OK and I refresh the screen we can see that this is appearing now in French and if I click on another link over here again it's appearing in French and we click on uh, saint Crier, then again it's all in French I get the same, same sort of thing if I go back to internet options and I click on languages and I move let's take German I move German to the top of the list here and I click OK I realize I clicked fairly quickly for the screen to refresh but uh, I, you've seen it once already and I do a refresh you can see this is in German uh, I go back to the home page home page is in German click on uh, login and you can see the, the page is in German now let's just be clear what we're getting here just because I've set the what's called the accept language header just because I've set the accept language header to German doesn't mean that the application suddenly automatically just appeared in German uh, no clearly I've, I've gone and um, prepared this application to understand that it could be translated into German and French uh, I'm sorry it's not a it's not a magic bullet uh, that you just get that for free it's really not that clever so let's take a look at the source code behind this. Here I am in the global ASAX. Um, and if I scroll down here, in order to implement this solution, I have added an application begin request. So standard ASP.NET here. This is going to be called uh, on every single request. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the request and checking to see the user languages property. So this is what the what's called the accept language header, that value that I set inside the dialog box. This is passed into user languages. Uh, it's the accept language header passed uh, across to the server, and it's in my user languages here. So I check to see, is it not null? And it's an array of user languages. So did I get at least one language in here? Um, and in my case, I will have. On the next line here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the very first language. Now you can see in the dialog box that I was showing a moment ago, I had many languages in that list. So what you might like to do here is you might like to say, the user has requested French and German and Spanish, but our application actually has only got German and Spanish. So this particular implementation is very crude. It's just simply taking the very first language and then trying that. But you might like to make it more sophisticated and say, well, we don't actually support French. Uh, let's keep going and looking down the list until we find, find one that we do support. So I'm taking the first value out of that. And then what I'm doing is I'm splitting it. Each and every value in that list um, is given a, a, a rating. Uh, so it's rated and typically the first one may say this is 80% uh, desirable and the second one may say 10% desirable and the third one 5% desirable. Um, in my application I don't care. I, I really don't care what rating you've given it. If you ask for French first then I try for French first and then if you ask for Spanish second then not in my code but in your code you might like to um, uh, try Spanish second. So. I'm just stripping out the extra information that I'm not actually interested in. And then I create a new culture info, the definition of whatever that language is that I've been passed in. Now, the way I've done it here is um, uh, somewhat um, uh, dangerous in that I'm just taking the string that they're giving me. There's no real security risk here. Um, but I'm taking the string that they're giving me and I'm creating a culture out of it. If the string they give me is, let's say, Klingon, for example, um, it's fairly unlikely that uh, my server here will recognize Klingon and this will throw an exception. There's no security problem, but obviously they've just brought down um, their thread uh, and I've just thrown the exception. And that's not so good for them, um, but they can't inject anything at this point. It's just a bad programming. So I'll, I'll do an example in a, a little while, which will tidy that up a bit. And then on the next two lines here, I'm taking the culture that they give me and I'm assigning it, as you can see here, to current UI culture and also current culture. So the .NET framework since 1.0 has had two separate settings here. Um, and they allow you to influence the localization settings, that would be current UI culture, and the globalization settings, that would be current culture, independently. 
The Microsoft recommended guidelines here say you should allow your users to set these two values independently of each other. And I, I am so loath to go, and go against the Microsoft recommended guidelines. In this one case, uh, yes, I'm going to do that. Uh, you will find that if you do offer your user the option to set these two values independently of each other, when you find the globalization settings meet the user interface, you'll get what's called a schizophrenic UI. That is where your application appears to have two languages simultaneously, and that's a bad user experience. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting both values to the same value that they asked for. So French in France, for example. If you've done this before, you may be wondering about this line here. You may be looking at this saying, I don't think that line's particularly safe, is it? Um, let's say they pass in French here, and you assign French to the current culture. In previous versions of the .NET framework, so prior to 4.0, this would have caused an exception, and it would have said, no, you can't do this uh, because it needs to be a specific culture. In the .NET framework 4.0 onwards, uh, you can assign a what's called a neutral culture, just French, uh, to the current culture, and that will work fine. So that's one way of solving this problem. Let's look at some other ways. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these. I'll just uh, talk about the, the next one here. Uh, the, another way to do the same thing is to use the browser's user agent. Now, you may have encountered this before. The user agent um, is the uh, version of the uh, browser which is being used to access your website. So typically, people use this to say, is this Internet Explorer, or is this Firefox, or is this Chrome, or is this IE7, IE8, IE9? Exactly what browser is accessing my, uh, my website? Actually, there's more information in it than that. So specifically, if you install French Internet Explorer, the user agent contains a string saying, I am Internet Explorer, but I'm French Internet Explorer. And that would be a fairly big clue to your website to say, well, if you're a French Internet Explorer, you probably want the French version of my website. So there's an example there which will allow you to delve into that and uh, set it according to the user agent. The next one down here, another option available to you, will be to get the culture from the IP address, uh, your user's IP address. Now, I'm using a service there called Host IP, which is a free service, and you can read through the source code there. It basically, you pass into the Host IP um, service the IP address, and it gives you back a bunch of information, including the country of where that person has come from. Same thing happens on the, the next example down here, except I'm using a library called GeoIP. I'm using the free version of this, um, and this is certainly faster than host IP uh, because it's local. Uh, it's a database that you load locally and, uh, and therefore it's an extremely fast call. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the, the next one down here, uh, which is setting the culture from the URL. Let's start that up. Again, I'm just going to run this one first so you can see what we get out of this. And here's the MVC3 application, uh, and I can go off to the About page, and it's really not very surprising at all. Let's, uh, let's just go to Login so we can see a bit more text on the screen. So the URL at the top of the page here says localhost, port number, and then account, and then logon. I could request the uh, culture that I want inside the URL. So here I'm saying I'd like to get the French logon of the account controller. Let's hit return here. You can see it's clearly in French. The nice thing about this is uh, if I go to a nested page, you can see on the tooltip down the bottom of the page there, this it will maintain the fact that this is the French version um, of this website. And I click on there, we go to the French version. The user can switch between uh, cultures very easily just by picking out his DE for German. And there's the German version of the website, and it still maintains the fact that we are on the German site. So that's all doable, uh, and that's through the URL. Let's see how we implement that. So I'm looking at the global ASAX file again, and I have taken a route here. And so this is a new route that I have added. 
you can see for this root it's prefixed with a culture and all I've done is I've added a constraint for the culture I've said that whatever is passed in here must be part of this culture list this variable here culture list this culture list is set on these two lines just above um, and this is going through a list of all the known cultures, converting it to an array, and then converting that array to a string, a pipe delimited string. So this is a fairly effective way of saying um, this route is valid if the culture is a known culture. Actually, that might be a little bit too um, too wild uh, because they could type in anything here. So. You could uncomment this line, and this could be a fixed list. Say, well, actually, this application only supports French and Spanish, so I'll limit it to this fixed list. That might be a, a better approach. You pay your money and you take your option. So having identified that uh, it's part of this root, the only thing to do now is to change the root handler to be culture MVC root handler. And that's one of mine. That's a new one here that's uh, created on this line at the top. So let's go and have a look and see what this root handler does. It's a regular MVC root handler, um, just inherits from that, and like all root handlers, it overrides get HTTP handler. I start off by extracting the culture value out of the root. So in my example, this was either um, FR or DE. And then I've got a little method here called get culture info, where uh, you can debate uh, whether this practice is pleasant or unpleasant, but I'm attempting to create the culture and then catching an exception and returning null. There are better ways of doing it than this, but this is one way of doing it, um, and one might argue about that. That's not the important point. The important point is it is at least safe, and I'm checking to see, did I get a null? Uh, and if I didn't get a null, then I set my uh, UI culture uh, to be the value that was passed in, and I set my current culture to be this thing here, create, sorry, culture info dot create specific culture. And this is the safe way of doing what I was talking about a moment ago, where you say, well, you've given me the culture of French, I'm just going to convert this to a specific culture, which in the case of French will be French in France. Um, and this would work in any version of the .NET framework prior. Uh, and including prior to 4.0 and including 4.0. So a simple little handle, handler there to allow you to specify the URL, um, uh, specify the culture on the URL. Let's move on to the next possibility. So again, I'm not going to do this one. Um, this is where you can set the culture in the profile. So the user, we present the user with an option, there's a page which says, well, what, what language would you like? And that's a fairly explicit instruction from the user to say, I would like French, or I would like German, or Italian, Japanese, whatever. The last option on the list here is actually the option that I recommend. This is all of the above. And what I recommend you do here is you say, take you start off by looking at the quality of the information that you're getting. So if you get an explicit instruction, like an instruction in the URL, then you go with that. Or if you get an explicit instruction, like they've set it in their profile, then go with that. Everything afterwards is a guess, so you have a hierarchy of guesses. You say, well, let's look at the accept language. Anything in that? No. Let's look at the user agent or the IP address. There's a variation on this theme that you might like to adopt, which is the variation used by Google. Um, where they look at the accept language and they say, is the accept language ENUS? And if it is, they just ignore it. They don't pay any attention to the accept language if it's ENUS. And then they look at the IP address and see, where exactly are you? The main reason for that is ENUS is erroneously set on so many browsers that it just isn't worth um, paying attention to that setting. Obviously, that does annoy some people in the US who explicitly set that value, uh, but those people are far outweighed by the people who have set it incorrectly. OK, I'm going to move on then. The next, the next section that we're going to cover here is uh, localizing ASP on MVC. All the demos that I'll do from this point on uh, are using the browser's accept language in order to uh, set the current culture of the application. I'm simply doing that because it is easy for me to control and easy for me to demo. So 
We've actually seen this application before. This is the one that I've been showing uh, on the previous demos that we've just seen. Um, and here's we'll, we're going to start off by looking at the controller. So there are three areas in this application which have text which need to be localized. Um, there's the controllers, um, there's the views, and there are also the models. So we'll look at each piece in turn. In this demo, I'm going to look at the controllers and the views. We'll look at the uh, models a little bit later. So in this home controller, you may have recalled if you've seen the MVC3 template before, you get a view bag which has a message and it's assigned a hardwired string. And the hardwired string says, welcome to ASP.MVC. Clearly I've modified this and what I've done is I've got something here called a home controller, controller resources. Let's take a look at what I've done. There's my home controller. And you can see just above it, there is a folder called resources. It is not necessary to create a folder called resources. I do this out of convention and you'll see why when I expand the, um, the folder there. Because if you don't put um, all of your resources in a separate folder, then you'll see they clutter up your, your folders with a whole load of extra junk that you don't really want. So what I've done is I've created a ResX file. There's my home controller resources ResX file. This is a, ResX is an XML file. Uh, you could read it using any kind of XML reader. Uh, it just contains resources. It's been in the .NET framework since 1.0 and I'm sure that almost everyone's seen these so I won't delve into this too hard. Uh, it's a set of name value pairs. So you create a name and I've called mine welcome and it's got a value, the original English value, which was uh, welcome to ASP on MVC. Set of name value pairs. A couple of things I want to point out with uh, what I was doing there. Notice that I've got a home controller resources, and if you're looking carefully, you can see there's an account controller resources. I do not have a single bucket into which I stuff all the resources for the entire application. I know that if you've seen demos doing localization before, you may well have seen somebody showing the single bucket for the entire application. Please don't do that. It's a really bad idea. There's so many reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and I, uh, I'm not going to go into all the reasons, but just think about the look back to the dark, dark days when we had global variables and people used to put all of the global variables in a single file and just think about that's what you're doing with resources and if that doesn't convince you then get me on Twitter and I'll tell you all the other reasons why you really don't want to do that. So what I've done is um, my convention is if I have a home controller then my corresponding resources which are the resources which are specific to the home controller are called are called home controller resources. That naming convention works in Windows Forms, ASP.NET uh, Web Forms, ASP.NET MVC, Silverlight, WPF, Windows, Mobile. That naming convention really works. Um, you pick whatever naming convention you like, but that's a, a tried and tested one. So something I, I very briefly want to uh, look at is if I expand out this ResX file, you can see behind it, there is a home controller resources.designer.cs. Indulge me for a moment if you've already seen this kind of thing. Uh, I, I, there's a point that I'm getting to here. Inside this uh, generated file, you can see there is home controller resources. So I had a home controller resources ResX file, and now I've got a class called home controller resources. There's a bunch of code down here that I'm just scrolling through, bunch of code, bunch of code. And the other important piece of this file is this static property called welcome. So I had a resource entry called welcome. I have a property called welcome. And that makes this piece of code here work. That's what this piece of code is doing. It's going off to what is called my strongly typed resource class, and it's getting out this property uh, called welcome. Now, I spent a couple of minutes talking about that because that's essential. That is your link with resources. Now, I know there will be many people who are thinking, yeah, but I don't use ResX files. I want to store my resources in a database because my resources are volatile. Absolutely, there is no reason why you shouldn't do that, apart from the fact, bear in mind, 
um, a, a storing your resources in something like a database is considerably slower than storing them in what is effectively a, a memory mapped file, uh, like the resources which are embedded inside your satellite assemblies. Ignoring the performance difference, I, I recognise that you may well want to do this. If I have time, I will come back to that. But the point that I want you to take away from this is that you need to bind to a strongly typed resource class. It may come from your ResX file, but it may come from some other, some other source. It's the strongly typed resource class which is the important point here. OK, let's uh, close that down. So let's look at the French version of this. So what I've done here is I've taken my home controller resources and then I copied it completely to home controller resources dot fr dot resx. So I put the name of the culture immediately before the resx um, extension. And this gives me the French resources. You can see there, there is the French string uh, bienvenue sur asp.mvc. And I've done that again with uh, the German and on and on and on. And with the count controller here, I've done followed the same process here, and you can see in my um, error code to string uh, method, um, you can see I've got lots of references to account controller resources, and there are many more resources um, in the account controller. Okay, so that's localization um, of the controllers. Let's take a look at the views. So here's my um, index view, and there's very little in here, um, except here you can see it says view bag title equals, and then normally this would say, um, uh, I've forgotten what it says actually, uh, I think it says index. Um, and this looks pretty much like a strongly typed resource class. So let's see what how that's actually implemented. You can see once again my convention here is to have a resources folder, and in the resources folder, I have index resources.resx and index resources.resx. Uh, there I have index title, and it was it was home page, not index. Um, and my CSHTML file is simply using the strongly typed resource class. There we go, same as I did with the controller. Uh, the only difference this time around is that I've added a using clause so that I can get access to this strongly typed resource class. And that's a simple way to localize uh, your views. OK, I think that's uh, all I'm going to cover on this particular demo. Let's look at some other possibilities. Uh, there's an option of uh, modifying the namespace so that you don't actually have to add a using clause, and I'm going to leave you to take a look at that. Uh, let's take a, look, take a look at using a custom HTML helper. So let me just run this application so that you can see what's going on here. So this is very crude. You can see um, on the left hand side I have something which says company name and then there's a text box. And if I change my uh, language to be French in France, uh, whenever I bring up this dialog to change the language preference, um, I'm going to click on this extremely quickly and you may not be able to see it on the screen refresh, uh, but I think it would be boring because you've seen me do this uh, several times now and you're going to see me do it many more times before the end of the application, uh, before the end of the presentation. Uh, so I, I'm not really going to wait for the screen refresh to uh, uh, show you the changing of the culture setting. So when I change to uh, French, it says th the company name changes to nom de la societe. Okay, well we already know how to do that, except this particular uh, example is doing something slightly different. This is using an HTML helper that I've written called meta label for. So this is a regular label for um, with an enhancement, a meta label for. If you've done localization in ASP.NET web forms, um, you may be familiar with the idea of having a meta tag, and that's where you uh, you click on tools and then generate local resources, and it modifies your HTML, and it takes each and every ASP.NET uh, web forms control, and it adds an extra property on the end, which is called the meta tag. Um, then at runtime, when it goes to render that control, it goes looking in the associated ResX file, uh, or, which is embedded into your satellite assembly, 
um, for corresponding values. So here my label for um, says I'm a label for company name, which is ordinary and nothing new there at all. Um, but it adds on the end here a meta tag, company name label. If I take a look here at indexresources.resx, you can see there, there's an entry called company name label underscore alt and company name label underscore value. So what my uh, meta uh, uh, HTML extension is doing is it's looking through the resources for anything which is company name label something or other and then matching an HTML property, either alt or value, and then stuffing in the value from the resx file. So this is basically working using the same pattern as ASP.NET Web Forms and I use that as an illustration um, of how easy it would be to solve the problem that way if you don't want to write out reams and reams of code which simply do those assignments manually. Right, let's move on to something else here. Uh, let's move on to using specific views. So the examples that you've seen so far use a single view for all cultures. This one's slightly different. Here's an AS, This is an ASP.NET MVC4 application. Uh, it's coming up in French at the moment, and I could change it to German. Let's, uh, let's pick the About page. So here's the About page. You can clearly see it's in French across the top there. I didn't bother translating the Latin into French. I thought that would be slightly bizarre. Um, the thing I want you to take away from this page here, if you haven't seen MVC4, is that on the About page there is a great big block here, and on the uh, right-hand side there is a, a much smaller sidebar on the right-hand side. Okay, well, let's go to Tools and then Internet Options and change my language to be German. And there we go, that's German, and refresh the page. OK, now you can clearly see it's in German, which really won't be any surprise to anyone. I'm sure you could have guessed that. The point that I want you to take away from this is all this page has done is it, it's simply been localised. I had it in French before, I had it in German uh, afterwards, but it's just localising the text. Have a look what happens this time around. Now I'm going to change the language, and this time I'm going to bump Japanese all the way to the top. Let's click OK here and we're going to view this page in Japanese. Clearly it is in Japanese, there's no denying that, but what I want you to take from this page is the layout is completely different. So French and German and English share the same layout for this page, but Japanese, not only is it localised, um, has a different layout. So let's take a look at what I'm doing there. I'm using a feature of ASP on an MVC4 called uh, display modes. Now this feature is originally there for the purposes um, of supporting mobile. So you can have a different display mode for iPhone or for Blackberry or Windows Phone 7 or, or whatever. And it works great for that. But this feature was really well implemented because it's not hardwired into using that particular solution. It's just a feature which you can use in any way you like. Now I'm using it um, to show a different view according to the culture. So on the top line here you can see I've created a new default display mode called JA-JP which would be Japanese in Japan. It has a context condition here which says um, use this display mode when this condition is true. Now normally you'd check to see do I have an iPhone uh, to see should I use this display mode? What I'm doing is I'm saying if the current UI culture's name is Japanese in Japan, then look for a view which has the extension Japanese in Japan. And sure enough over here, originally I have an about page and that's the about page which is being used for English and French and German. But here's a different about page which is being used for Japanese in Japan. You can see what I've done here is clearly not only is it localised, but it's um, uh, completely laid out differently, with the sidebar being the main section and the main section being the sidebar. So this solves the problem really well. So it's cost me like four lines of code where two of those were curly brackets, so uh, a, a minimal implementation. A couple of things to point out here. 
One of them being, notice that um, when I have the index view, the index view does not have a similar uh, JAJP CSHTML file. So what ASP on the MVC is doing is it's looking for the JAJP, but if it doesn't find it, that's okay. It'll carry on and use what might be referred to as the fallback view. The other thing to point out is I wouldn't actually do the, do this the way that I've done it. So what I've done is I have performed the localization inside the CSHTML file. I actually think it's a really bad idea and you definitely shouldn't be doing this. Um, <clears throat> the problem here is how do I get the localizer to localize this text? Um, I would have to send them the CSHTML file, which would be a really bad idea. Please don't do that. Apart from the obvious security problems, I am massive. I, actually, that's it. It's a security problem. I could list the other problems with this, but um, as soon as you've got a security problem, then all other bets are void. So what I would actually do is um, I would localize this page in the same way that I localize the about.cshtml page. So exactly the same solution there. Okay, I'm going to move on then. Let's pick... Uh, da, there we go. What are we going to look at next? I've got another demo here which talks about um, output caching and how you can get it to respect the culture of your application. I'm going to leave you to read that one. Um, the one that I want to move on to next is localizing routes. And of course, when I say roots, uh, I come from the UK. So for our US cousins, I would like to say routes, uh, but I hunt and I hunt and I look for that W in the routes and I can't find it. It's somewhere between the O and the U and I'm sorry, guys, I've got to say roots. So it's for the next 10 minutes, five minutes, for the next five minutes, I'm going to say root and you can just wince every time I say it. So. Let's show the demo here, and uh, then we can look at the code. Okay, so we're looking at the English version of my website. Um, and if I go across to the About page, you can see on the tooltip, it says slash home slash about. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> Let's go to um, Internet Options and change this to be French in France. Okay, let's do French in France. And the website comes up in French, really not at all surprising there. However, if I go across the right-hand side here, in the tooltip you can see that the um, the route itself, the, the route to that page, has been localized into French. So if I click on this, clearly you can see in the uh, address bar there, it's in French. Now, you may or may not want to do this. I would actually encourage you to do this. I think you do want to do this. Uh, the first time you go to a website where the URL is in another language to your own native language, and you look at it and you think, I don't understand any of that, you'll realize just how, how um, not offensive, how awkward this seems when, when it's not in your own language. So I think you do want to do this. Similarly, this would work in German, but you can just trust me, it does work in German. Uh, let me pick, um, let me pick uh, another page here, and you can see clearly it's still in, in French here. Actually, I was going to use the German, uh, and you can just trust me on this, to show that uh, if it contains uh, an umlaut, for example, uh, then it will still work. This system still works with uh, non-ASCII characters, providing you're using a browser later than IE7. So how does this work? So there is a feature in ASP.MVC, let me just uncomment uh, this block of code here, uh, where you can decorate a action with something called an action name. So there we go, I've, I've got a, uh, uh, an action called index, and I have called it my index. So this would uh, affect the URL. Uh, and that works just great. Bear in mind that when you do that, you actually can't just return um, the view anymore because if you, if you do that without naming what the view is, it will look for a view called my index and not index. So to solve that, it's a fairly simple process of saying, I need you to look for the index view and not the 
some localized version uh, of the name of that index view. The problem with action name is that's as far as it goes. It will not go any further. You cannot localize my index. I mean, obviously, you could, you could uh, provide an action name for French and then another action name for German, and then you could have all of your actions then point to the same action. It would be awful. I really don't recommend you do that. We need a better solution than that, and here's the better solution. This is one I've written, a localizable action name. And this accepts two parameters. It accepts um, the type of a strongly typed resource class, in my case, home controller resources, and the name of a property on that strongly typed resource class. So if I just open up that um, ResX file here, let's go to the uh, home controller resources. You can see there I have index action name, and it's English, uh, sorry, it's index in the English version. And in the German version, it's still indexed. Sorry, that's not very helpful. But you can see that the about action name there is Uber, uh, which has got an umlaut on the U, and, and that does indeed work. So on our home controller here, we decorate it with the localizable action name. Um, and if we take a very quick look at this localizable action, uh, name attribute. It's an action name selector attribute, which is basically all, where all of the work um, happens for the action name. And all I've done here is I've simply overridden is valid name. Uh, we get uh, passed in some values and we have to say is this uh, name valid? And then what I do is I just simply get the localized action name and that uses a little bit of reflection to go in and dig in through the a strongly typed resource class and get that value back out again. And then we're done. That's it. There's no more work to do on that. Um, the controller is slightly more difficult than that. What I've done here is I've added in a localizable controller uh, name, which again is one of mine, which is set up in exactly the same way. Um, requires a bit more effort to get that to work um, uh, by changing the uh, uh, Sorry, by changing the route which is used. So let me just uh, show you rather than talk over the top of it here. Um, and where did I put it? Where where have I put it? Oh, here we go. <clears throat> um, uh, we change the root handler to be a localizable controller name root handler, and then it looks through um, uh, the get HTTP. Uh, sorry, looks through the root data for the controller and then does the translation there. And you can extend this to work with um, areas and you could also extend it to work with the parameters themselves. I'm going to leave you to work through that, but you can see the basic idea of how that's going to work. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on to the next section, which will be data annotations. So we looked at localizing controllers. We looked at localizing views. Now let's look at uh, localizing the model. So in this example, I've got a person model. Um, let me just run this and you'll, you'll see what the person looks like. The person, we've got a, a display for model here and an editor for model here uh, with various different values in it. Um, in my model, you can see that the given name there has got a required attribute associated with it. Um, it's got a string length attribute, and one of my custom attributes must start with Smith. Um, and then the salary has got a uh, data type attribute. Then the number of children's got a range attribute. And then I've got a favorite US state here, um, which has got a regular, as regular expression attribute associated with it. So you'll notice if you're looking at that code that um, there was no actual text in any of that. So let me start breaking some of these constraints and you can see what happens. We'll stick in a family name. Yeah, probably not. I don't think so. That's, uh, there you go. There's a perfectly good family name. Um, and let's change the salary to something invalid. And Mr. Gates has been a very busy boy. Um, and his favorite state is Avon. And I click on save here and you can see on the right hand side uh, this is all in French. 
We get this for free. These are the default annotation strings. Now, prior to running this demo, I've gone away and installed the .NET Framework language pack for French. I've also installed the ASP.NET MVC3 Tools Update language pack for French. So you are seeing all of these uh, uh, validation strings appearing from those language packs. Now, let's just go and change my culture here to be German. Uh, let's move German up to the top of the list and click OK, click OK, refresh the screen. And this time around, any moment now, any moment now, any moment now, there we go. Um, you can see this is not quite the same. If you notice here, that's clearly the top one's in English, the uh, second one's in English, and then the third one is uh, Der Vert, uh, 10 point. 12 is for salary nicht gültig, uh, which is in German, So, and the rest is in English. So what's going on here? Um, in this case, I have installed the ASP.NET MVC 3 tools update language pack for German, um, but I have not installed the .NET Framework language pack for German. So we've got a kind of a, a mix and match here, which would be bad. You would want to install both. So on the one hand, we look at this and we think, so is the message of the moral of this story, is it install the uh, language pack for your language and then install the ASP on an MVC three tools update language pack as well. So as long as we install both language packs, are we good? And for the languages which are serviced by those language packs, yes, you are definitely good. However, there are 24 languages uh, available, sorry, 24 versions of the .NET Framework language pack available for different languages. There are only nine for the ASP on MVC3 tools update. So if your language is one of those nine, which is uh, a subset of the 24, then you're good and you don't need to worry. I live in the UK, I live on the border between um, England and Wales, and there is no Welsh .NET Framework language pack. So at that point, if I wanted my application to support Welsh, then I couldn't use the default strings. There's no way you can do that. So you will have to put in um, localizable strings. Let's see how do we do that. Uh, let's do some data annotations here. And the solution to this is to use this display attribute. So here's the display attribute. Um, <coughs> Uh, which has a hardwired value for given name, but you'll notice, and, and that is not localizable into French or German or anything, but you'll notice that this use of the display attribute um, accepts a resource type and a name. And again, this uses the pattern that I was showing just a moment ago, where you can see um, that it's the name of a strongly typed resource class, and then it's the name of the property on that strongly typed resource class that we want to go and get. And that is localizable, and that's the correct way to solve that problem. Now, I've shown this example um, with the display attribute, but it works with um, uh, most attributes. So I recommend that uh, you follow that approach, and that's an easy way to localize um, your model and the validation messages for your model and most things for the model. OK, so. I think we'll leave that there. Some other things that I'd like to talk about. We've got just over 15 minutes left, so I'd like to talk about um, JavaScript and how we can internationalize it. We'll talk about localization, globalization, and, and then uh, how globalization will meet uh, date picker and how we can solve some problems there. Let's start off with uh, localizing JavaScript. Let me just run the program once again. Like to show the end result before we look at the code. Um, this is probably the most tragic demo that you're going to see, not only um, in my presentation but indeed in the whole conference. I do apologise for just how sad and tragic this uh, this particular demo is. It's awful, but the code's quite cool. Uh, so we've got an alert box with "Hello World" in it. Yes, it's as, that's as good as it gets, frankly. Uh, let's click OK there and shut this one down. Let me see, let me show you how I did that. Clearly, I've got some JavaScript here. I'm using a bit of jQuery uh, to say, 
uh, when the document is ready, then I want you to uh, put up an alert and then what appears to be a strongly typed resource class which gets some Hello World property. Now, in this particular example, I could have solved the problem this way because all I'm doing is I'm localizing a CSHTML file. So I could have solved the problem this way. But just pretend for a moment that this is actually in a separate .js file then if it was in a separate .js file, I would not be able to use a strongly typed resource class. So, and, that, and, and I have not used a strongly typed resource class in this particular demo. So let's just take a look here. You can see there's my um, index CSHTML. There's no folder which says resources here. And there's no, there is no resex file um, for this, which builds a strongly typed resource class. However, there is something else. If I take a look at my scripts folder, you can see inside the scripts folder I have a, a folder called resources. And you probably won't be too surprised to learn that inside the resources folder I have index resources.js. And the index resources.js has got exactly what you would expect it to find in there. However, this is still not a strongly typed resource class. Let me just close that down and show you what we did get. If I expand out the resex file, you can see behind the resex file, I don't have a .cs file. I've got another JavaScript file. So let's take a look in there. This is a JavaScript object literal. So there's my index resources JavaScript object literal, and it's a set of name value pairs. Hello world got an element there called hello world, and the value of hello world, hello space world. If I take a look at the um, French in France resources, Let's just take a look at the resources themselves. Uh, we've got a, stri a, uh, a name well, of Hello World and then a value of Bonjour to Le Monde. And if we take a look at the file that gets generated from that is index resourcesfr frjs and expand that out. Surely probably not too surprising that it contains a JavaScript object literal um, which has the French resources in it. So when I look at my CSHTML file, um, I am getting the JavaScript object literal. I, I'm not getting some strongly typed resource class. Okay, so a couple of, couple of things to resolve there, because at the moment this is still smoke and mirrors. Um, if you've done this kind of thing before, I think the first question on your lips will be, uh, how? How did I get a .js file out of a resex file? And here's how we did it. If I go across to the properties here, or oh, not there, sorry, let me just try that one again. Um, if I go across to the, yeah, one more time. Good. If I go across to the properties here, you can see there is something called a custom tool. Now this is true for all ResX files, and this is the, the tool which is used to generate uh, the code behind for this particular file. Now. My one says JavaScript resource code generator. Now, if you try this on your machine, you won't have one of these. Um, this is where you need to download that source code from the book that I wrote. Um, and in there, you will find a code generator. In fact, you'll find, I lost count, maybe 10 code generators um, that do various clever bits and pieces. But in this particular case, this one is generating JavaScript from the ResX file. And that's what's solving this problem here. The other piece that appeared to be magic was, so how am I getting access to this strongly typed, sorry, this uh, JavaScript object literal inside this particular CSHTML? And I'm doing it thanks to this line here. You can see this line points at scripts, resources, index resources.js. Now we know that there is the .js file here but there's also a French.js file, fr-fr.js, and that's not what it appears to be. What this little helper method that I've written is doing, UI culture content, is it takes any file and changes the extension according to the current, uh, the current UI culture. Actually, it's doing a bit of probing first to see whether that file exists or not, and if not, it goes to the fallback. Actually, it's slightly more sophisticated than that. It will go from specific culture to neutral culture to fallback. So it's it's doing the correct uh, resource uh, fallback process. 
And that would be how you would localize your JavaScript. That's one way of doing it. Now, there are other ways. Um, before I talk about the other way of doing it, let's talk about globalizing JavaScript. So, let's just run this application once again, show you the end result before we get to the code. And this is probably the second most tragic uh, demo that you're going to see in this presentation or the whole conference. Um, I've got a button and I'm going to click on the button. How exciting was that? Uh, so when I click on this button here, you may recall that my culture, uh, my accept language header was set to German. I get the German date, Mitwok uh, uh, 18th, and then I run out of German accent as if I had any already. Um, and if I change my internet options uh, to be French in France, then we would expect to see the French in France. Uh, let's just change this one to be Welsh, just to prove a point here, and click on set date. And trust me on this, that is the 18th of July um, in Welsh. Now, JavaScript is clueless uh, when it comes to uh, globalization. Its globalization support is largely non-existent. Let's be kind here and say non-existent. So how am I doing this? Let's look at uh, what my page looks like. So my page has got on it um, this input button, the button that I just clicked on, and it's got an on-click event uh, where the on-click event calls a little uh, JavaScript function called set date. Here's my set date method up here. There we go. Um, and my set date method gets used a bit of uh, jQuery to get me a reference to the uh, today text box. And then I call on the today text box val to set its value. Then I do something called globalize.format, which I come back to. New date, well, that's JavaScript. That's plain, ordinary JavaScript, nothing clever there at all. And then d. So the all important bit here is globalize.format. Microsoft have been fabulous in this respect. They have released something called the Globalize Framework. And this is basically a very large part of the functionality that you see in system.globalization made available to JavaScript. It's a truly wonderful piece of kit. You definitely should be looking at the Globalize Framework. Now we are seeing it here for the purposes of manipulating dates, but it is a large part of the things that you know and love about system.globalization. I'm just scratching the surface here to illustrate what it can do and to point out that it is there and this is the answer to this problem. So I'm calling globalize.format, which is like uh, date time to string. Um, I'm not telling it which culture to use. So that's what's happening up here. In my uh, jQuery uh, little method here to say, uh, when the document is ready, what I'm doing is I am going away and getting the current culture. I'll come back to that line in just a moment. So I'll come back to that. The very next line here says, set the globalized framework's default culture to be whatever I found on the previous line, which for me, for me will be CYGB, Welsh in the UK. Um, that says whenever you go to use a globalized method and you don't tell me which culture to use, then use that as the default. So let's come back to um, this line up here, uh, which has got a, a meta tag here. That line is thanks to this bit here. I've just created a, another little uh, HTML helper here, which injects the current culture as a meta tag onto the page so that JavaScript could pick it up. And, that, and that's pretty much... This, these two lines here are boilerplate code. You can include that in, in something that's used everywhere if you like. The last piece of this jigsaw is this bit here, the globalized framework itself. So that's uh, globalize.js and it appears inside my scripts folder because I've downloaded it earlier. There's my globalize uh, folder and way, way down the bottom here we've got globalize.cultures.js. That's effectively system.globalization for JavaScript. Ah, I lie. That's complete nonsense. Ignore that. 
we have globalize.js, and that's effectively system.globalization uh, namespace available for JavaScript. I have another line here which says, go away and get me all of the culture info, sorry, all of the culture info information available to the .NET Framework 4.0. Now that's this file here. There we go, that file there. And that would mean that you could use any culture information for any one of the several hundreds of cultures that the .NET Framework 4.0 understands, including, in my case, um, a custom culture, CYGB Fix, which is a custom culture that I created on this machine. So including that custom culture. Um, that sounds great until you realize it's 847k big, at which point it's really not so great anymore and you think, I don't really want to do that. So at that point you would uncomment these two lines here, which say, go away and get me the culture file for the specific culture that I am interested in. So if we take a look here, and I scroll up and I find that culture uh, somewhere, somewhere is the culture I'm looking for. There is CYGB, actually uh, not, so I haven't quite done this demo the right way around. This is in the next demo, but there we go. There is just the culture for Welsh, and it's I don't know, about 1k big instead of the 847k big that was fairly alarming uh, just a moment ago. So I encourage you to use the globalized framework. It's a beautiful piece of kit, an excellent uh, result from Microsoft. Some things I need to finish off here um, because I've got five minutes left. So um, let's take a look at, uh, I'm skipping, sorry, let me just tell you what I skipped there. I skipped uh, JavaScript globalized localization which is another way of doing localization. Um, you can wade through that. It's based on a similar kind of approach to the one I was showing before. Okay, let's talk about the date picker. Here's a jQuery UI date picker. Now, this date picker, there we go. Let's actually, let me just change my culture here so we can see it. Uh, da -da, let's go to, we haven't used English for a while yet. Let's use English. So, Here's the date picker, and that's ordinary. We've seen these before uh, a few hundred times. Um, nothing particularly amazing there. The date picker itself has an extensibility mechanism. It allows you to say, here's the cultural information that I want you to use for, um, the, uh, for the calendar when you drop down. Um, and that's good. And if you do, if you search for a bit, you'll find uh, various bits of JavaScript that people have written for assorted cultures. You are going to find at most 20 odd, 20, possibly 30 cultures out there at best. They won't match the cultural information in the .NET framework, so you are likely to get some kind of mismatch between your JavaScript code and your .NET framework code. So that's not entirely wonderful. Uh, just to prove a point here, I'm going to take Welsh. Whoops! I'm going to take Welsh once again. Move it to the top of my list and do a refresh here. There is no Welsh um, regional information for the jQuery UI date picker. However, this calendar clearly drops down and shows in Welsh, which is a culture that the .NET framework does understand. So the question is, how am I doing this? And I'm doing it. Well, let's just take a look here. There's my input field, which is a class of date field in it. And there's my uh, jQuery ready function. And you really won't be at all surprised to learn that I'm setting it to be a date picker here, which is just ordinary and straightforward. This previous line here tells the date picker uh, what regional information to use. And that's a fairly ordinary line as well. What isn't ordinary is this line here, update date picker from globalize. This is a method that I've written which says, go away and update um, the date picker's regional stack of information with the information that I know from the globalize framework for this specific culture, which in my case was uh, CYGB fix. And that's how you solve that problem.
you update jQuery information with the information from the globalized framework. You get consistency between uh, JavaScript and between .NET Framework, and you get to bump it up with the hundreds of cultures that uh, jQuery is not aware of. A beautiful solution, very, very happy with that. Let's move on in the last few minutes that I have. Uh, let's take a look at uh, data templates. So, yeah, let's take a look at this one. Um, so I've got a display for model here and a regular editor for model here. No particular difference. Um, I'm not going to cover, so you can, using this particular approach of using data templates, you can localize uh, booleans and enums. I'm not going to show that particular demo at the moment. There's a, a different demo that I want to get to. And let me start with German here for this demo. Phone numbers. Very briefly, let me show you the code here. If I take a look at uh, the person class, there we go, there's my person class. I've got a phone number on my person class here. Now, I'll bet you you've needed to validate your phone numbers before, and the way that you did that was uh, you needed a regex to validate your phone number. I'll hazard a wild guess here. What you did was you went to regexlib.com and you typed in phone number. And if you wanted a UK phone number, then you typed in UK phone number. You take the first regex probably at the top of the list, but maybe one that you like the look of, and you pasted it into your application and you're done. And then when you needed one for French, then you searched on French uh, phone number and you pasted it in again. Well, it's a law of diminishing returns because you really aren't going to find enough regex uh, values that way. So here's what I've got. Uh, let me just uh, click on save here. You can see the French, sorry, the German error message uh, showing us that this is not a valid phone number. I am, I've got like one minute to go, so I'm not going to go through the code here. I'm just going to tell you how I did it. What I did was I used Google's lib phone number uh, library. And Patrick Mezard did a port of this from Java to C Sharp. I have a link for that on my slides. Um, and basically I created a validator using the uh, Google lib phone number library. Uh, and an extension method which goes away and gets me the phone number information, the, the regular expression for a landline phone number uh, according to the current culture. And the information available in Google Lib phone number is extensive. Clearly, they have a search engine which has indexed, uh, one would say, probably all of the internet and they understand phone numbers. They've exposed that knowledge in a great library which breaks this down um, into all its constituent pieces. I will leave you to read the code there. I'm just pointing you in the direction of the correct solution to that problem. Um, last piece. I am kind of out of time, but I'm going to slip in the last little bit here. Um, first of all, I want to show you what the problem is, and then I'll show you the MVC solution. The problem looks like this. This is um, address layouts. So here, address layouts vary across the world. And the moment you see an address laid out, what to you would be the wrong way, it's quite irritating. Imagine that you are a data entry clerk and you need to enter a hundred addresses and all of the pieces of the address are all laid out on the screen in the wrong order. That's really irritating. So if we look at the address layout for the UK, um, you would have one, two, three address lines, and then a town and a city, and then followed by a county, and then a postcode on the same line, and then a country. In the US, only marginally different, the town and city on the same line as the state and county and the province, no address line three. In Brazil, um, the postal code goes at the beginning of the line, and then it's the town and the city. In uh, the Czech Republic, then we've got postal code before the uh, town city, but the state on the next line. Germany, it is important that you have a blank line between address line two, and then you don't have a country, you have a country code on the same line as the postal code. You get the idea here. If we go to uh, Japanese 
again completely different we go to russia again completely different they're all laid out differently this is a standard globalization problem that um, needs to be solved and here is a solution to that all of that information i have pumped into an extension method for a region info object and i read that region info object and display it according to uh, uh i sorry my my address my editor address for model displays it according to the information in the region uh, info object so you can see here this is the layout which would be correct for germany there's the postal code there's the city if i change the uh, internet options to be um, <coughs> to be french in france we can see that we get a different layout there we go oh not a very different layout um, but you get the idea and you could have guessed it out. So I'm, again, not going to go through the source code there. You can read the source code. Mostly I wanted to show you that is a solution to um, the address layout problem. But I wanted to offer that as an idea because there are other problems which need to be solved the same way. Um, uh, one of those is names of people. Uh, the idea that people have a first name and a last name is simply a Western culture. Uh, the way that people structure their names varies throughout the world. And you would solve that same problem this same way. Okay, so I am. I really need to be done here um, because I need to finish off for the next sec, uh, the next session. I had some stuff on the slides here uh, which I'm going to ask you to read. Um, so there's some stuff. Here's some uh, useful links that you might like. Um, there's the source code for this presentation, there is the source code for the book, which again, uh, the source code is free, there's Google's lib phone number, there's a link to Patrick Mezard's C-sharp port of that, there's the globalized framework, which is fabulous. Here is a set of summary items that I wanted to cover, uh, which I am not going to have time for. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Q&A now using the uh, system in live meeting. Um, I'm not going to be on here for long because I need to make way for the next session. So I will hang around and uh, use the Jabba chat room and Twitter after this. So let's take a quick look at the uh, questions that we've got. And how do I do this? Ah, here we go. Um, let's starting down here. Are the language packs been deployable to a shared hosting environment? Or do I need to talk to the hosting provider to see if they could install it? Uh, you need to talk to the hosting provider. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they're not been deployable. Um, how would you pull localized strings for data annotations from the DB um, in from the DB in batch mode or dynamic at runtime? Let me show you how you do that. Uh, let me just pull up a demo where I can do that one. So the question here largely is, uh, how can we make our resources work? Um, how can we make our strongly typed resource classes work with something other than a resx file? So let's take a look at this, this uh, code behind here, if you like. There's this line that I talked about here inside the strongly typed resource class. Uh, which goes away and creates a resource manager. A resource manager is uh, the class that goes away and gets uh, ResX files. So let me just change that. If I go to Index Resources ResX and go to Properties, I wonder why that's struggling so much to do that. Um, let me just do that. There we go. You can see it has a custom tool here. I'm just going to change this custom tool to be... Uh, a public resource provider code generator. Uh, again, this is one of mine. And if we take a look at the code this time, I have this that code generator generates the exact same code as the public resx uh, resource. Sorry, public resx file code generator that comes with Visual Studio, except this line here. It changes the resource manager to use a resource manager provider. And then earlier on in your application, you say the type that I want to use for my resources is, and then you say 
WCF Resource Manager or DB Resource Manager, which is one on my website, or OData Resource Manager or Web API Resource Manager, XLIF uh, Resource Manager. That's how you solve that problem. Uh, and where were we? We were on here looking at the Q&A. So you talk about cultures which are not supported by .NET, e, in particular Welsh fix. How is this implemented? So um, the .NET framework from 2.0 has a concept of custom cultures um, which you can create. If you go to my book's website, www.neti18n.com, there are two free chapters from the book uh, which you can just download. You don't need to buy the book. One of those chapters is all about custom cultures and it tells you how to create custom cultures. Uh, can I allow my MVC app to localize to custom cultures? Yes, absolutely. Yep, and I do do that, and I recommend you do that. Um, in particular, that is good for pseudo localization, um, and the examples that I was using all support pseudo localization. I just didn't have a chance to show you that. Any tips on localizing user generated content, uh, as in a content management system? Um, yes, uh, it, it it is. Uh, tougher, um, but I would write uh, some wrapper for your uh, content management system um, as a resource manager and plug it into tools which understand how to use different resource managers, uh, like the tools on my website. So the tools on my website are free, uh, you don't pay anything for them, uh, but you can use them to localize using different systems like uh, databases or user generated content. If you have your translations in various ResX files throughout your project, how do you reuse the translations? Yep, that's a good question. Um, we So you do need to have one central um, uh, resource file for the localizations which are reused. Yes, indeed. All I would say there is they are a lot fewer than you think they are. So things like OK and Cancel, yeah, absolutely, no problem. Um, but they're not quite as prevalent as you think they are. Do you have world readiness advice for sites that use many web servers? Clearly ResX remains a viable option. Should I distribute them via DFS on the equivalent? Uh, okay, so lots of questions there. Um, the ResX files are embedded in um, your satellite assemblies, so particularly if you compile your website and then distribute the compiled website, then you will not need to distribute the uh, ResX files. Uh, they just be part of the build process. Will I need to use a custom resource manager or something? Will my application lock the satellite assembly? Um, will it lock the satellite assembly? You mean when it loads it? That's a great question. I am momentarily stumped. I used to know the answer to that, and I'm only going to have to guess now, so I'm not going to do that. Um, how do we handle localized content updates with ResX files? Um, so you can change your resource manager so that it actually loads the ResX files at runtime instead of having them embedded in satellite assemblies. If you want to do that, um, I have a resource manager on my website which does exactly that. It loads the ResX files at runtime. Uh, and that would solve that problem. Okay, good. Uh, I am done. It's twenty. It's past 25 past um, the hour. I thank you very much for listening to me. I will hang around on Twitter and in Jabber. Um, thanks very much for listening to this presentation and hope you enjoyed ASPConf.